you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we conclude the unravelling the mysteries behind the origins, motives and cultures of the seven fallen houses in the world of darkness. This episode will focus on the house of the falling knight, the Slayers. You come once more to my Wunderbauerzerhauser, my wonderful home. My German's a little rusty, well, just give me some slack here. Learn it from a fox, actually, but you needn't learn the deets on that, and I don't think you would be interested anyway. You're here to learn about the final house. You heard that right, little lamb. You have heard it all. At least, all the bits that I think are worth you knowing. How the land was raised, the animals that flourished, and the seas and stars that provide much fascination to your ilk. We have even had the chat about the birds and the bees, but with so much in life in the world, there are equal amounts of death, and that means there are certain folk in the world that help things pass on from one life to the next. You could say that it is a particular specialty of mine, which shouldn't surprise you given how I discovered your existence, but stranger things have happened. I, Zachariah Zimri, am an angel of death, one of the Halaku. We once aided plants and animals to their deaths when their time came to be, either through natural means or God's supposed monster race, the humans slaughtered them for food and support. After the rebellion, we'd focus on reaping of human souls, or slay them, hence our more modern nickname, the Slayers. We're known for as tormentors of souls, reaping them from the flesh of bodies, or trapping them into their spirits into vessels of the Slayer's choosing. Whilst I can't speak for every individual Halaku, most of us follow in the idea of understanding death. Some Slayers have abandoned the idea, but use their talents, limited by the mortal coil, to prevent needless killing and punish said scoundrels. Of these individuals, some do for a new understanding of death, whilst others do so out of guilt. It will come as no surprise to you that we choose mortal bodies to possess that have nothing worth living for, or choose to exist only for an expense of those around them, be it another person, role, or faith. To that end, reaping faith for us is actually a difficult one. The fact humans die is a reminder of our failings, which is particularly difficult for most reconcilers and which is where you will find most of the slayers. Some forego these mortal questions and act not as Halaku but as angels, which usually involves mimicking a different house, usually the devils or fiends, filling the mortal vessel with secrets or prides depending on the house they are emulating. Some set up basic churches with ravenous slayers coping just fine with murder cults. Others seek solace by aiding the terminally ill, easing the fears of death. Whatever the approach, we have diverse followers to complement the many facets of life and indeed death. Slayers from the living world find many human concepts to be completely alien to them, as well as the other houses that did not like the air that floated around our existence. It has made us fairly cautious of our cousin, so to speak. We tend to scrutinise as someone with a microscope that studies creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. Sure, we can be open-minded about a lot of things once we have reached such a decision. We won't back down from it easily. This is more problematic for those higher tormented demons who become far more removed from reality and wish to make a mark on the world. Like all the other houses, we possess a tree of laws that aid us in our deathly goals. The law of death, sometimes known as the law of mortality, allows the Halak to inflict both physical and spiritual decay, to know death and to rule the bodies of the dead. New kindred have necromantic capabilities that can do similar things as well. Master of this law, Namtar, the visage of death. The creatures known as Namtar are shrouded in mystery and fear. Their black wings and misty robes make for a chilling sight, and even the gentlest of them can strike terror into the hearts of those unprepared for their presence. When consumed by torment, their very existence seems to drain the life from everything around them. They become cloaked in shadows and seem to lose all feeling, unable to experience pain, love, or anything at all. Interestingly, the Namtar were originally designed to be the ultimate recyclers. 
Their purpose was to simply remove life from an object with a single touch and then return the materials of the body back to the earth. However, after being cursed to use their powers on humans, the Namtar were left distraught. Some of them even built realms where their beloved souls could be safe from the Nurgle. In an attempt to ease humanity's fear of death, they helped develop rites of mourning such as funerals. And while some of the Namtar came to enjoy their new jobs, Others were cast into the abyss, already greatly removed from the world around them. The Law of the Realms allows Halaku to enter and leave the Shadowlands, or Haven as many call it, keep that in mind, though this is really the Underworld, which was created by the Slayers and the Demon Charon, for which the Wraith equivalent would be so named by the Lady of Fate, as an honourable nod, keep that in mind as well. Only experienced Halaku may make good use of this lore, because only they have the innate ability to navigate and survive in the Shadowlands. Eshragal, the Vizard of the Realms, is the lore that this is associated with. The Ereshagal appear to be garbed in black robes and have long skeletal fingers, strongly resembling those classic Grim Reapers and the Ferryman that probably springs to your mind right now, keep this in mind. As they move silently through the shadows, their faces remain obscured. Despite lacking wings, they possess an un parallel agility to navigate the Shadowlands. The Estragal are fearsome and ominous, embodying the dark power of oblivion. Unlike the Halaku, the Estragal were created after the fall. The Nurgle and Namtar sought to prevent human souls from fading away after being collected, leading the Halaku to establish a realm where the deceased could seek refuge from their ultimate fate. Before the fall, many who would become the Estragal were involved in destroying failed experiments with life. As they strive to escape the abyss, they struggle to recall their past creations and the source of oblivion remains a mystery to them, myself included. Finally, we have the Law of the Spirit, which was originally used for guiding the immortal remains of the life forms to the next world. When humanity became mortal following the rebellion, this law was also used to guide human souls, otherwise known as as wraiths to sanctuary so loyalist angels of death could not take them away and possibly destroy them. This law may seem rather underpowered compared to the necromantic purposes of the Giovanni vampires and the Euphantoni mages or whatever the fuck the cunts are called. Don't ask, remember that its purpose was never meant to be commanded but to guide, but that means the law serves its purpose quite well. Those who master this are the Nurgle, the Visage of Spirits. The angelic Nurgle are graceful beings that seem to float effortlessly and never touch the ground. They are a sight to behold and have the ability to sense the presence of incorporeal souls. In contrast, the tormented Nurgle are transformed into monstrous creatures stained with blood and howling with the voices of the damned. They are ruthless in their pursuit of souls and show no tenderness. The Nurgle once worked along alongside the Namtar, their fellow Halaku, to recycle life back into the universe. However, when their task was applied to humans, it took on a new and terrible meaning. Despite this, many Nurgle remained comforters of the dying, unwilling to let go of the souls that went beyond their reach. They helped souls anchor themselves to the fiends they loved and created a realm of the spirits with the Namtar to prevent them from wandering aimlessly into the living world, as we just discussed. The Nurgle were also loosely associated with vampires, and they considered themselves fortunate compared to the punishment of Cain. Now, what we do now is just limited by the mortal coil, but the Halaku were much greater once. Our function from God was the creation of what was known as the Second World, a world where we could access as freely as the First, which was the older six houses could not. This goes by many names, but you know this is the Underworld. It is easy to assume and confuse our role with the Second World and assume they are separate states altogether. They are not. Creation was just the beginning of God's master plan. Things were dying and the Halaku were originally formed to make room for creation to renew itself. We created the things that would be sacrificed so that all creatures could sustain themselves, grow and change. The second world would simply grow from the first. When this was explained to them, the six houses, they simply returned to their work without question. No one questioned God then, though our existence as reapers did plant the first seeds of doubt as we were given access to the underworld and shadowlands. The other houses were not used to being barred from any aspect of reality. We were shunned by the other houses for this and other reasons. It didn't bother us, as our calling was as noble and demanding as the rest of them, requiring us to understand more than just the creation of the living. 
We tracked the cycle of life and their interactions to better understand it and see when its influence on the world was done, leaving it ripe for our special touch. We individually watched groups of organisms flitting between the realms of reality. We were essentially proud gardeners who understood what every creature changed through its life cycle. The world would change without the direct intervention of the angels, no longer the preserve of the angelic choir alone, a revelation made by Uciel, throne of the Sunderud. I would not be surprised if God told him more than the rest of the house did not know, but that is not really important now, I guess. Sometimes God would call for several creatures to die at once, for which we would descend en masse to do his bidding, but our work was a solemn one. The other houses did not understand our work nor what the second world would be, and because of this, our extermination and destruction of what they had carved out did not please the other houses. They would soon learn the purpose of meaning of destination through the reapers. This would change the spawning of humanity, God's perfect creations that we initially wanted not to part in handling. That was until we began to ponder humanity's primitive limitations and how this worked into the master's plans of the host. Their existence would naturally make us question our own work, but not with fear, but with cautious curiosity. As we watched from afar, we found the same frustration at the limits God imposed on these creatures, much like the other Elohim did. Our frustrations, however, harboured a more painful twist as these humans began to form attachments to animals and plants. When they died, the humans were filled with pain and guilt. They simply lacked the comprehension, the very capacity to rationalise the deaths, to create meaning for them and to move forward from the pain. They wept much like a toddler removed from their favourite plaything. We all wished to reveal ourselves to humanity to explain the purpose and function of death's part in the cycle of the world. I personally asked Yusio why God would forbid us from interacting with the mortals, and I am sure many of us did, but they could not answer. No one in the house liked that humanity's comprehension was limited and lacked that means to come to their own conclusions, nor did we approve of their stagnation as the rest of creation developed. Though we tried to have faith Yusil would find themselves at the fate meeting would ultimately decide the fate of the fallen. The talk of rebellion and the ultimate total misunderstanding of the second world frightened Yusio to the core, or so I was once told. He stood in the opposition from the rebellion, angered by the words of Lucifer and haunted by supposed visions of coming storms that would tear through the world as the dead. He would warn his lieutenants of the coming rebellion, his decision before retreating to Haven. Heaven, I mean. The news would spread like wildfire, with many of the Reapers remaining loyal, waiting for God's plans. Of course, there were those that would become slayers and join the rebellion, only our involvement in the war was a very different to what most were up to. The murder of Abel changed everything. Humans were bloodthirsty now, so too were the animals. The underworld teared Abel's soul apart, whipping up a horrendous storm in the process. Reaper and Slayer would fight over lost souls, the latter no longer having access to the underworld as freely as the loyalist Reapers did, though they did not speak of the fate that came to said mortal in the fear of angering God, binding them to the spots in the earth. That said, it would be the likes of me, the Slayers, that would build Kajajia, the first city of the dead, a hidden sanctuary that was well away from the eyes of heaven. It was a fortress filled with the memories of dead plants and animals to keep the mortal soul safe during the war. This fortress became the secret base of the Alabaster Legion until it was discovered by the host. After a difficult battle, Azriel and Charon realised that a deeper realm was necessary for the safety of the mortals, leading to the creation of Haven the underworld. Although Kazajia continued to serve as Azriel and the Alabaster Legion's home, it was later conquered by Lucifer during the Long March, which prompted many slayers to abandon the rebellion and seek refuge in Haven, a dark dimension of memories that would later be known as the underworld, as I just said. The, in the beginning, Haven was a barren wasteland with no permanent structures. However, as the spirits grew restless, Charon ensured that fiends destroyed in the real world would be recreated in the memory of Haven. 
This allowed the dead to bring cherished items with them, tools and buildings to cross over and eventually entire cities to be formed. This might be sounding a bit familiar to you. Over time, the land and the memories was altered to allow the dead to reenact psychodramas and split their souls into two parts so they could converse and recover from the painful traumas that brought them with them in the war of creation. Again. That might sound familiar to you, wraiths being creatures of two parts. Charon was also worried that the host that would find Haven and attack it as they did Kazajir. To prevent this, he expanded the realm, creating a vast sea of memories where small islands floated but could only be found by secret byways. On one of these islands, Charon built a grand city where the oldest ghosts and his fallen lieutenants would reside, but Charon was still not satisfied with the level of protection Haven had, so he built deeper, constructing a fortress beneath the city. Yes, that fortress, and that is Wraith Arcana where you will not find it anywhere else. The veil would soon fall and the loyalist reapers would storm Haven, furious about the hoarding of the dead, particularly with the Nephilim, who would become the first ferryman, who you know all about. Said ferryman and some ghosts were able to destroy the angels, and it was fucking glorious. It would not last, of course, as Charon and Ducia would clash and the former said to be lost into the far shores. Azriel was captured and bound, and Cerberus was destroyed by a dozen Malhium minutes after he severed the byways. The war was over and race were alone for the first time. Haven was destroyed and some slayers felt the smallest sense of relief as they fell into the abyss, spared of the continued pain of humanity's mortality. The doors that kept us within the abyss were made out of the ruins of Haven, which was how we knew where the souls were. The early days of our return to Earth were horrifying. The casual attitude you all have for death killing each other over the pettiest things is just… wrong. We found ourselves in the recently dead, murder victims or soon to be suicidal. We gravitated towards them because death called to them. We had experienced death like few others in the world and those vital seconds upon possession changed everything for us. Death carried on without us. They die and their souls move on to wherever it was destined for them to go. Some responded by actively trying to go back but to no avail. Many now reason the only way to show their love for humanity is to guide the process of death once again so it inflicts less harm. Some even responded by chasing the moment of death as often as they can regardless of the type. What would happen is that this would bring the House of Loners together rather than speak to the other houses for help, for the most part. It is not in our nature to do so and we're still bottom of the social hierarchy. Ironic really given how scattered we all are. Anyway, we exchange information about death and how it works in this world. Without it, we have no purpose so we are forced to work together. We lack any true hierarchy but those who lead, lead and those who follow, obey. Some Charonists believe he is out there with his trusted few either as they or as weird monsters in the far shore somewhere in the underworld. Some slayers, such as myself, deal more with the Shadowlands and the fetters of spirits. There are few of them, but few Luciferians. He was the poster child for a rebellion and do as they please whilst the Haliku while subverting enemy plans and saving humans. Some make up the Faustian numbers, but more make up the Reconcilers, questioning for God and recreating the world as it was before the recovation of humanity, the revocation of humanity I should say. To them, protection from death can only be granted by God with no amount of evolution of purification can provide. Some of my faction, the Cryptics, exist as it is a neat fit for investigative and seemingly abstract duties. I believe that, along with the Reconcilers, the Raveners have the largest amount of Slayers, which probably isn't as large as a revelation as I started to build it up to be. Some believe they are carrying out God's duty or bolstering their spirit numbers to storm heaven or to become judges on God's heaven, but it is usually just a great envy of the living that leads them to the delight in destruction over and over again. The world is being murdered, it is not dying, murdered. Some might call it being raped, some call for the ultimate destruction, others feel that by restoring balance, the Slayers might actually earn the peace and understanding from humanity they ever craved all along. What do you think? Oh, I'm sure you can work that one out for yourself. What I can share with you with the utmost confidence, what I think about the understanding of the Angels of Death have over death. No one knows, and I do not think we will get a conclusive answer anytime soon.
To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.